Hey everyone and welcome to Pixels, a podcast for the discerning gamer. everyone and welcome to Pixels, a quick solo show today. Uh, there's not a ton to talk about, but there are a few tidbits that I think are worth uh, discussing very quickly. So I'm going to go through uh, the state of play, the PlayStation Direct that was just... Um uh, broadcast a few days ago. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Oculus Rift S and Rift Quest. Did I not talk about this last week? Or last episode? I guess I didn't. Um, we're also going to be talking about the Valve Index VR. Also, um, something that uh, we can go over relatively quickly, but I figured it could be interesting for some of you that know, don't know exactly what all of these are about to uh, detail the characteristics and possibly what would be uh, interesting or motivating. And then a bunch of other little bits of news like EA Access coming to PS4, which is kind of crazy and unexpected. I feel like this wasn't made a big deal of because it probably isn't for... Uh, most people, but uh, from a business side, I think it's really interesting and a bunch of other things. So let's get started with the state of play where there were a number of games. Uh, Monster Hunter fans are very happy about the upcoming expansion that is set in the north. Um, in the north meaning it's Icebound and I think it's Iceborne, the name of the expansion. Uh, there's also stuff changing in the uh, old world, so everyone is going to get something out of it. Uh, a bunch of other games, Predator, which is coming in 2020, which could be interesting, um, and a few others. But the two I, I, I noted were first Away. Uh, yeah, I've got to talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is finally resurfaced. Uh, but Away is one that also struck me because it is one of the strangest concept, <laughs> concepts for game I have ever seen. Essentially, it looks like a flying squirrel simulator um, <laughs> where you are some kind of weird animal on an island and you have to survive. But it felt so... It felt like nature. And I don't know if that is even a, a, a proper way of qualifying a game, but it felt like nature. That's the what I take away from it. And the the lower, like macro, not macro, the opposite micro level of nature, like insects and small animals, and you're a, a flying squirrel, I guess, and you're running around it feels like platforming and god knows what else it's very strange we don't have a lot of information uh, on what the gameplay is actually going to be i think is the most uh you know potentially downfally part of it and uh, i don't think we have a lot of information about release uh, dates or anything like that but it was intriguing so i thought it was worth mentioning and the other big announcement, of course, from that uh, very quick, very short state of play, which was about 15 minutes. Uh, and by the way, they set expectations for all of this uh, quite early on. They did say they were essentially going to talk about Medieval Remake, the Medieval Remake, which Medieval fan are going to love. I wasn't one of them, so it's kind of, yeah, whatever. But um, so it, it was approached in the proper way. I think that was uh, uh, well played on their part. But uh, they did show the remake, uh, the new uh, details on the remake of Final Fantasy 15, uh, not 15, 7. Uh, of course, the legendary PlayStation 1 game, which uh, was presented with, with much fanfare and applause at E3 in 2015 and uh, essentially has not been heard about since. So it was starting to get into vaporware territory, and it's good that they finally showed something because it was uh, uh, becoming a joke. And what they're showing is pretty impressive, to be honest. It is looking a lot better than uh, the 2015 version. It's one of those things that... Um, seem like yeah it's the same but when you look at both side by side it you realize it's uh, act 
actually a lot better in the new version and uh, it looks good it's i i make no secrets about the fact that i'm not necessarily a big fan of remakes and remasters um and i don't have any kind of reverence for you know uh, out of principle for uh, old things that i enjoyed at the time i think i'm um maybe even more than most uh, usually when i look at them again nowadays i judge them a little bit more by today's standards and even though i do have admiration for what they might have done at the time i whenever i say oh it was a great game i would say it was a great game at the time i wouldn't say it is a great game and unless it actually holds up i think a lot of people look at old games and perceive them with their uh emotion from that time which i think i tend to not do and this is why i have very little reverence for those games as i say but with this one so usually the remakes remasters i'm not so much into but this one I think I might uh, be convinced to get and even play to an extent because it is in the same um, style or same spirit, I should say, as Resident Evil 2, uh, which came out uh, earlier in the year, meaning they really reimagined the game for a modern um, audience. So, and, and, while I say I don't have a lot of reverence, out of principle, I do have very fond memories and a, a great admiration for that game, as I often say, for what it did at the time. And I did play it and love it. So um, maybe this one, I could be convinced to give it another try when I was never uh, a client for the, the remasters that came out uh, on other platforms as, you know, the, the game it was back then. Um, I think this was a, a pretty cool way to end that state of play. Uh, they haven't really hit us with anything huge on state of plays yet and we don't know if e3 which is in less than a month it's like in three weeks it's crazy three or four weeks um and we say that every year but it comes around so quickly every year there is going to be more information about uh, final fantasy 7 remake at e3 probably they said more to come in june we don't know if there's going to be a state of play at some point uh, during e3 to try and steal a little bit of thunder or maybe catch a little bit of thunder from the conference we'll see um but they haven't really made a huge state of play yet uh at sony and maybe they will at some point um i think they are kind of smartly um, getting the low risk things out first and then maybe do some more exciting things in the future. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the um, series of uh, VR headsets that have been announced and will be available soon-ish. Uh, two of them are from Oculus and one is from Valve. Uh, let's go with the Oculus first. The Oculus Rift S is, you know, just like for phones, the S stands for speed, as Steve Jobs said it a few years ago. Um, but yeah, Oculus, Oculus Rift S is an upgraded version of the existing Oculus Rift, meaning you still have to connect it to your PC, although that connection is easier. I believe there's only one cable. Um, and the hardware itself is more comfortable, all of that, but it's still connected to the PC. So um, the, I guess the one difference is that there is no, um, there, you don't need the, the little beacons that you have uh, to place in your room, in your VR room, to position the device and to position yourself in the VR experiences, which is great. And that is a plus, meaning if you want a... Um, PC connected VR headset, the Rift S is an improvement over the Rift, and that is uh, to be noted. The, the Oculus Quest, though, um, is the more interesting one. That's the one that doesn't have uh, any connection. It's completely autonomous. It's essentially a smartphone um, chip inside the VR headset and you don't connect it to anything. So you have a screen, a chip, and uh, it can play Oculus games with the caveat that they need to be adapted. Um, I won't even say ported, apparently it's relatively easy, but they need to be adapted to play on the, on the, the Quest 
meaning the release uh, catalog is relatively restricted. There are 50 games when the uh, device releases. Both of them, by the way, are available in just about a week. Um, May 21st. So that uh, is coming very soon. Uh, and both of them are $399, $399, a little bit more if you count in euros because of uh, VAT, etc. But um, they are both like very similarly priced but differently positioned. And the Oculus Quest being completely autonomous is kind of the dream um, for the ideal VR scenario. Graphically, it seems to be holding up uh, to be quite good, actually. Um, so that is not so much of a concern, uh, although we should wait to see the actual tests once, it, once it's uh, available. But um, this, is, uh, this seems like it is graphically good enough and maybe even a couple of notches above that, which is really good. But the, the most important thing, and I think this is the most important thing to remember across these um, new Oculus products is that you do get um, six degrees of freedom for the headset and for the controllers, which, by the way, the controllers are the same controllers as the Oculus Rift. So you have the full controllers. And the reason I'm insisting on that is that um, the Oculus Go, which was a somewhat similar product to the Oculus Quest that came out a few months ago, um, was much cheaper, so about half the price, but it only had three degrees of freedom. So what those degrees of freedom mean is that three degrees, those uh, for the, the Oculus Go, means that you can only rotate your head and the, the little uh, remote control, which is not a full controller, um, but you can only rotate the remote control and not move it in space. And the same goes for your head with the headset on. So that means you cannot, um, uh, well, literally you can't move inside the VR experience, be it a game or another type of experience. And you can't model your hands in the uh, space either because the little remote control can't move and doesn't really make sense as modeling a hand. And for those who have been following my impressions about VR for a, a, a while, since I tried it a few years ago, um, to me, the real wow factor is, of course, being able to move inside the space is key. And having your hands modeled in that space is absolutely uh, uh, what will convince you that VR can be impressive and can work. Without that, all of the experiences I've had were meh to, I mean, of course, some of them were very disappointing, but some of them were meh to okay or just okay. But when you put the hands, then there's some real magic that happens because you you move your hands, you see it happening inside your uh, uh, your field of view, and that creates some real magic. Um, and so the Oculus Quest, even though it is a portable device uh, that also ha has inside out tracking, so the cameras will uh, situate you in space and you don't need the, the totems or the beacons uh, to place you in the VR space. So even though it's a very um, arguably simple uh, apparatus, uh, uh, apparatus, apparatus, um, you still have those controllers that will allow you to get full advantage of VR. So really the only tiny little drawback is the catalog, which is not the full Oculus catalog. But I suspect that they see this as the future and that they will port a lot of uh, games to that system because it, the Oculus Quest is going to have an upgraded version in a few years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This seems like the way VR was supposed to be from the get-go. So again, let's wait until they're actually out and uh, you can actually get reviews from people who have tried them. But as a concept, this is the ideal setup. Um, so Oculus Quest, really interesting. And of course, if you want something that you connect to your PC, Oculus Drift S is the one to go with uh, now. And it should be noted that it is more comfortable um, and the design, the hardware design is better than the old Oculus Rift. So of course, if you, if you want to get one, <clears throat> start VR on the chip, cheap, and you don't necessarily want to go with the PlayStation VR for whatever reason, then um, 
you could go with the original Oculus Rift that might be sold at a discount, or maybe even you could get one secondhand. Um, but the Oculus Rift S will be more comfortable, which is a key uh, thing in that whole ecosystem. So that's for the, on the side of Oculus. Um, and Valve announced the or gave the details about the Valve Index VR, which honestly, I don't know what to think about, or rather, I know what to think about. I think it is not a good deal because it is like super high end. And for some people, I guess when I'm saying it's not a good deal, I'm talking for the general public. There are some people that are going to be really interested in this, but the, the headset itself costs 500 bucks. Uh, it will ship uh, at the end of June. It costs 500 bucks, and you might think, well, 399 to 499 that's roughly the same thing. Yes, but that's the headset alone for $499. Um, if, you want, if you don't already have those beacons that were uh, sold by HTC with the HTC Vive, uh, okay, I'll start over. $499 for the headset. Uh, a couple hundred bucks or more for the beacons, which you need because there is no inside out tracking. It's only you do need the beacons to situate you in, in the VR space and the controllers, which are new, the, the knuckles controllers, which, uh, oh, the index. Uh, I never remember which ones are the knuckles and which ones are the others. But uh, the controllers allow you to move your fingers and um, show that in the VR space, which is cool. But between the beacons, the headset, and the controllers, you're up for a thousand bucks for that headset. That is more than double the price of the Oculus Rift S. Sure, it has a better screen. It is more, you know, uh, uh, it has like better resolution, better um, refresh rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that is a lot of money to put in to a headset for the kind of things you could get for less than half the price. So I'm not sure what Valve is thinking there. Um, I'm guessing they're gonna sell some of them to some people, but it is a tough tough uh, uh, deal to argue for, in my opinion. Um, of course, if you already have the HTC Vive, then as I mentioned, you could use the, uh, the existing beacons, so you don't have to fork for that, um, and it reduces the price to like 700 and change. But still, uh, that is still a lot of money. I guess you could buy just the headset but, and, and use games that you play with the controller, but again, that doesn't really make sense for VR, in my opinion. So, yeah, Valve is not really uh, winning, in my opinion. And uh, they have announced, I think, a couple of years ago that they were getting back to making games, or a year ago. But between Artifact and the issues with the Steam Store and uh, a bunch of other things, I don't know. I'm um, kind of disheartened by what Valve is doing at the moment and has been doing for the past few years. I would love to see them make games again. Maybe that's what they're working at right now. And they did fire a bunch of people from their VR section, maybe the uh, their VR department, maybe the Valve Index VR was almost done and they figured we'll finish this and then we'll move on to other things. They could be doing all of these at the same time, the store and the VR and the games, but yeah. Anyway, so Valve is uh, releasing the index and I'm sure that there are a few of you listening who are thinking, oh, but this is perfect for me and it has it's the high end of VR headsets and if that's the case, very happy for you. I hope you enjoy it very much, but I think that's a, a rare instance in the gaming community. All right, um, I did want to talk about that EA Access subscription service coming to PlayStation 4, which if you remember a few years ago when... Uh, so, okay, EA Access, EA has a number of subscription services. Well, two, I think. Um, one, which is has two different names, is available on Xbox and PC, and I think that's EA Access. That's the one we're talking about coming to PlayStation 4. It is the cheaper of the two. Uh, it costs five bucks a month or 
uh, 30 bucks uh, a year, which is a reasonable amount of money. Um, and it gives you access to their vault, which is not all of their games, but a good a number of classics. Uh, well, I shouldn't say classics. There are games like that are, let's say, over a year old. Um, things like uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2, Burnout Paradise Remastered, uh, Battlefield 1, uh, and of course, many of their sports games, uh, you know, NBA, NHL, etc., etc. So, especially if you're into the um, the, the sports EA, I think that might be interesting to you. And the EA Access Premier is PC only and gives you access to all of their first party games, meaning you get access to more recent games like, um, uh, you know, Anthem and FIFA 19 and all of those. Um, it, it should be noted that with EA Access, the cheaper one, you also get um, a few hours of access to those newer games. I think it's 10 hours. Um, it's essentially trials. So you could try uh, Anthem, Battlefield 5, etc. Uh, and decide if you want to actually buy them, which, again, is not a, um, you know, a, an insignificant uh, experience for the 30 bucks a month if you choose to go annually, which I think is probably the better way of doing it. Um, so those are the services that are available from EA, the subscription services. EA Access uh, Limited, EA Access Premier, all of their games without limitations. Well, a few years ago, they announced the service and announced it would it was also coming to Xbox One, um, which Sony quickly uh, responded to by saying, we don't believe, uh, I can't, I don't remember the quote exactly. Maybe I can read it in that, um, po Polygon article I'm referring to. Uh, yeah, the, the quote was, it does not bring the kind of value PlayStation customers have come to expect. Um, and uh, they said, we don't think asking our fans to pay an additional five bucks a month uh, for this EA-specific program represents good value to the PlayStation gamer. Um, so, of course, this was a long time ago. That was 2014. The world has changed since then. Um, and it's interesting to see that Sony is cooperating with EA on that front now. Uh, I think everyone's more, a lot more used to paying different subscription services everywhere. But... I don't think this is about the PlayStation 4 so much. Um, Sony, I don't think, has a significant advantage in allowing EA uh, to be on their PlayStation 4 at this point. It's nice to have for the people who want it, but they have already, as we've discussed many times, won this generation. They are dominant and uh, it, things are not going to change and this will not move the needle. However, I think that means something for the next generation because, of course, as we all know, when a console generation starts, then it's a giant reset button for everyone in the industry. And um, the the advance or the win that Sony has with PlayStation 4 um, doesn't mean anything once Xbox 2 and uh, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, I mean, uh, hit the market. And in that context, if Microsoft offers all the choice with all the different subscription services that you can think of, and Sony doesn't, then maybe some people are going to go to um, Microsoft and say, I have more options here. Um, and certainly it seems like Microsoft is taking the steps it needs to make that new system um, advantageous. So I think this is about PlayStation 5 or whatever it ends up being called. Um, and Sony will want to, to be as not open, maybe that's not the best word for Sony, but as welcoming as possible um, for that next generation, so as to not have a disadvantage compared to the Microsoft console. Which by the console and service, I should say, which we're going to get more information of very soon at E3. Um, that is 99% certain to happen. And uh, I think the biggest, the most important thing that I will be on the lookout for is the name for that service. I guess maybe it's going to be called xCloud or Xbox Cloud or uh, Xbox 
two will see. It's a difficult thing to to square because they have to uh, make sure it is a service. It is understood as a service, but also as a hardware device. Maybe it's going to be Xbox Two and Xbox Cloud, and you can get the Xbox Cloud on many, many things, including the Xbox Two. But we'll see how they explain all of this to the customers um, easily and and simply. It will be interesting. But maybe we'll talk more about E3 provisions, uh, provi <laughs> predictions. That's what I mean. That's provisions is a French word um, in the next episode. Um, Epic has bought Psyonix, which is the developer of Rocket League. Um, I think this is pretty smart, even though it sent, again, uh, many angry gamers into a frenzy going to downvote Rocket League on uh, Steam because angry gamers. Um, and I think this is a smart move because they realize they need, they have a platform and they are going to need, just like any other platform, when it is... Uh, infinitely easy to access you just need a click and an install and sometimes just a click maybe in the future with stream streaming services what differentiates you is not ease of access it's the catalog and uh, you do need your exclusives if you look two three four years down the line i wouldn't be surprised if epic uh, bought a number of other smallish studios um, to make their offerings a little bit more attractive because the squabble that's happening now between Epic and uh, Steam, I, I don't think is the important part of the next few years. And uh, Epic is looking mid to long term with this acquisition, I believe. Uh, Borderlands 3 it got the uh, gameplay reveal, um, which was, I think it was at no, PAX was the actual reveal of the, the, the title. Um, they had an event. That's correct. That's right. Uh, they had an event where they invited a bunch of influencers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's the first extensive look at gameplay we've gotten, if not the first look at gameplay. Um, there are two parts to this. I'll uh, uh, talk about the first one very quickly. Uh, first, it's going to release on September 13th which is probably a good date. I wonder what um, Bungie is going to be doing with Destiny, which traditionally, when they were with Activision, was coming uh, around those dates, uh, mid-September. So we'll see if they have competition there. But um, September 13, and Randy Pitchford, the ever-confusing uh, CEO of Gearbox, uh, said there was no microtransaction in the game, in no uncertain words he was making fun of companies that add microtransactions to their games and saying I, I i don't have the quote here but something to the effect of none of that bs or none of that nonsense i think is the word he used so watching the reveal you come out you come away with a very clear uh, message that you buy the game and there is not even a way to buy anything, be it cosmetic or arguably even DLC, like uh, additional campaigns and stuff in the game. Um, and that comment was very quickly and confusingly walked back by um, other developers at Gearbox and PR people and um, some journalists apparently are saying that this is not what they're hearing from people at gearbox that there are microtransactions probably of a benign nature something like uh, exotics and uh, uh, exotics uh, cosmetics and maybe like uh, uh, dlc packs and stuff like that but when you say no microtransactions and none of that nonsense that's not what people expect so again an example, I mean, we'll see. Maybe it will turn out that there is absolutely no microtransactions, but it seems like that's not what we're hearing now. And if there are indeed microtransactions, it is another blemish on uh, Randy Pitchford's <laughs> uh, reputation, not reputation, but um, goodwill, the, the sentiment of goodwill that people have towards him. At least, I mean, he's a, a weird person and... He seems like 
he seems shifty, I guess, is how I would describe it. And maybe that's unfair, but there's been so many... You remember that story about um, the, the USB key that was lost somewhere and that had porn on it and documents from uh, Gearbox, and that was a property of Randy Pitchford. And the porn itself is not... I'm not going to go back into the whole thing. It's just story after story after story and there was a um an incident with the voice actor for claptrap claptrap um the <laughs> once funny robot from um borderlands uh which honestly i thought was pretty fun back in the day i think now it's a little bit it's he's done and he's still just exactly the same in borderlands 3 um but anyway the voice actor um from the first game or first two games um went on twitter saying that um after what gearbox has said about him uh he was planning on staying silent and after what they've said which was not very flattering um he wanted to set the record straight about pitchford and the way the company treated him which again is not very flattering so all of that put together I don't know. There's stories of like physical assault and stuff like that on Pitchford's part. I guess what does that mean? Is it like he shoved him? He got in his face? What but still, none of this is flattering. So when there's all of these stories, uh maybe all of them are wrong. It's possible. Maybe all of them are inaccurate. And Pitchford is a wonderful human being. But it's not the impression I think most people are getting. Anyway, that's the development part and maybe even a little bit too much inside base baseball. It doesn't matter, or does it, if the game is cool, maybe. Um, but the game seems, I mean, it seems cool. Um, it just seems like uh, it's, it's a lot like Borderlands 2 or Borderlands 1. Maybe graphically improved. There are some um, some quality of life improvements. Uh, things that a lot of people noted was when the developers showed that you could slide or hop over a fence in the game, which you couldn't in previous titles. Everyone in the audience was wooing and clapping, which is great for people who are mega fans of the game. But I think for people who are just regular gamers, this might be a little bit um, underwhelming. Uh, I mean, obviously, this, these are not just the, the only improvements, and maybe the game is going to be awesome. I hope it will be. I'm looking forward to it. But the gameplay reveal showed a um, something that is maybe a little bit closer to the Borderlands formula that I was hoping for, which is a sentiment we echoed last time we talked about it when the original reveal happened. Um, and it seems to be confirming that impression. Um, and as I said back then, I think the reason this feels a little bit disappointing is that we've waited so long for the next titular uh, Borderlands. And so having it be so similar is a little bit underwhelming. But we'll see. Maybe it will be super awesome and the feeling will still be there and it will be everyone's game of the year. We'll see. Um, there was a Game Informer uh, reveal of the uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 gameplay, um, which if you haven't been following, I think half the reason I'm talking about this is that I'm just a big Marvel fan. Um, but the Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 is a Switch exclusive game, which I was getting a little bit worried about because they're not talking about it a lot. And Marvel is such a hot property right now, which I'm... You know, it makes me surprised that Nintendo or whoever is developing it is not um, pushing it a little bit more. And um, so this gameplay is kind of in the same, same um, area. It's like, it seems okay. I don't know if I'll have the time to play that on top of all the other games I want to be playing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, 
it seems the gameplay video is weird. Uh, go to YouTube and just search, you know, Game Informer Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 and you'll get the exclusive gameplay uh, video. At times, it seems really fun and at times it seems kind of dull. So, and that's coming from a big Marvel fan. So I don't know. Well, we'll see. Uh, John Wick is getting into our video games. There's uh, something happening in Fortnite with John Wick's house. If you don't know, John Wick is a series of movies, uh, the third of which is coming out these next few days. Um, very popular, a lot of fun. And for the reason I think this is interesting is that we've seen um, uh, events with the Marvel movies, well, the two Avengers movies with Thanos last year and uh, the Avengers mode this year, a few weeks ago, in Fortnite. And now we're seeing a John Wick themed thing in Fortnite, which makes me think maybe this is going to be another avenue for promotion for cultural events in that gigantic cultural event that Fortnite is. Maybe we're going to see other movies. I'm guessing Avengers, you know, Marvel didn't pay to be in Fortnite. That was probably a no, no money exchanged uh, agreement that was um, fun for all parties involved and cross-promotional, so it was good. John Wick, I very much doubt this was not something that, uh, who is it, Warner, um, paid for to have in, uh, in Fortnite. That I would be very, very surprised. Um, but I don't know, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's something, I mean, there are bounties and there's a bunch of, um, a, a bunch of things. It's not just the house that is there and no one can... can understand why it's there it, there are, there are gameplay uh related things uh in there so that's a an interesting way of approaching promotion uh for a cultural event or a movie i wouldn't be surprised if the trend continues and maybe it will even happen in other games but obviously fortnite is the one everyone is looking at at the moment still um, and there's, by the way, a strategy game um, based on John Wick as well. So um, John Wick is game aware, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, I did want to talk about Mordhau. I guess that's how you, you uh, read the name, um, which is a game, a Steam game that is uh, that was kind of the hit uh, the surprise hit of early May, I suppose. It's a medieval combat game um, that is very different from For Honor, uh, which I really like. I haven't tried Mordha Mordhau, but I'm really wondering if I should because it's the kind of temper, like uh, flash in the pan, but cultural gamer, gamer community zeitgeist where everyone is playing it for a week. Um, and that was... <laughs> I don't know if it's for a week, but certainly communities form about these things. But everyone was talking about it for a couple of weeks, I guess, one or two weeks. And it seems interesting, but I don't know if it's so interesting that I want to go and, and pay for it. <laughs> um, not necessarily my kind of game, but I wanted to mention it because it's kind of incredible. It's part of those things that happen every once in a while. Um, the There's one thing that everyone is 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 rushing to and i think it has a little bit to do with uh twitch culture because a lot of twitch uh, streamers are playing the same game over and over again and sometimes they want to switch it up a little bit and if there's something they've heard from their friends you know streamer friends they're like oh i might give this a try and if the game is is pretty good um they will play it for a few days streaming, and so that, you know, um, increases the visibility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it ended up selling like half a million copies, uh, which is enormous for such a small game. It was actually kickstarted back in the day. Um, and it's, it's extremely successful. Um, I think it's already starting to die down a little bit, so I don't know that it's going to become a huge phenomenon like uh, other games like it in the past. But I did want to mention it because it was everywhere. So that was pretty impressive. And you might want to check it out if it's uh, if medieval combat, both melee and uh, ranged, are is something that you're interested in. Um, of course, it's uh, we, we're getting um, 
yearly results for some Japanese companies. And I did want to mention that Capcom is has had record profits and uh, revenue for the second year in a row. Um, they expect a little bit less next year, but going back uh, higher the year after that. Um, and Bandai Namco uh, is is still benefiting from Dragon Ball Z, uh, Fighter Z, and other Dragon Ball games' uh, success. So they are also doing really well, uh, which is great because a few years ago, Japanese gaming companies were not doing so well and weren't so hot. And uh, it's really heartwarming to see that by refocusing on what they were really good at, um, high quality, let's say double A uh, productions rather than triple A and getting what they needed out of the Japanese tradition, but also knowing how to take uh, some of the things that worked uh, from the Western gaming tradition, they managed to turn around something which really, quite frankly, a few years ago, maybe let's say five, six, seven years ago, the Japanese gaming industry was on the verge of collapse. Um, it, I think I might be overstating it a little bit, but it was creatively, um, uh, you know, empty uh, back then. Of course, there were exceptions and you don't need to send me the examples of the few games between, you know, or the many games that uh, were very good between, let's say, 2008 and 2014 or whatever. Um, but... It was there was no doubt that there was a creative drought. The Japanese gaming uh, companies didn't really know where the, where to go uh, from where they were and very successful in the mid nineties to mid two thousands. So that's really heartwarming for me as a, um, a, a deep appreciator of Japan and um, Japanese gaming um, that they are doing well. And the one I wanted to talk about even more was Konami, which we have all poo-pooed for the past few years because they were, uh, well, they're not great um, people, it seems. And uh, the way they treated Kojima specifically and their game franchises were making us think that that was it for gaming for Konami. They were going to do like... Uh, like gyms and workout places and pachinko and that's it well they're doing really well and uh they are doing uh well in gaming as well it's you know a few titles like baseball titles and a lot of mobile but they're still doing well there are some um some you know collections like collections for old Can castlevania games and uh contra is coming and stuff like that but um, yeah, so Konami is doing well as well, which I guess is a good thing. But um, there are some that aren't doing as well. But uh, overall, the Japanese uh, gaming industry seems to be going a lot better. Um, oh, and by the way, talking about Castlevania, there is a uh, date for Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which I kickstarted. So I'm happy it's going to be coming out soon-ish. It's June 18. Um, if you don't already know what it is, you probably don't care. But uh, if you do, it's coming out on June 18. And a week after that on the Switch, which uh, that's the version I'm getting. So hopefully it will be okay. Um, there's a U.S. senator which wants to, who wants to uh, introduce legislation about loot boxes. Essentially what he's saying is he wants to prevent loot boxes from games that are targeted at children. Um, so let's put aside the difficulty of determining which ones are specifically targeted at children and all of those discussions, um, which I think we've already had when we were talking about loot boxes. And I'm not going to go over it again. But this is both a milestone because it's actually being discussed as a piece of legislation in the U.S. Senate, um, and also feels like something that is somewhat opportunistic by that senator. He's very young. He's under 40, I believe. Very conservative, um, very right-wing, which 
is not surprising. Uh, you know, it, that piece of legislation is not necessarily surprising because it's uh, framed as protect the children from uh, predatory practices, which, you know, is an argument that many have uh, made. So I think it, it kind of works. But um, I think my point is we don't know. So it's groundbreaking in that sense, but I don't know how much support it is going to get. Um, it might scare the gaming companies into doing something about loot boxes themselves so as to not be regulated. But um, yeah, I think my conclusion from the, um, from the discussions about loot boxes in the past was what I could see realistically happen is uh, requirements for... Um, for rates of drop rates for items from loot boxes for everyone, um, some uh, uh, restrictions on um, the the type of loot boxes you can do. That's a little bit more far fetched. But for example, you can't have loot boxes that affect gameplay in a game that is already uh, paid for. That seems like it's more of a developer choice. But another thing I could see legislated is uh, an age restriction. So unless you are over 18, you just cannot buy a loot box. And that is totally doable. Um, and now, of course, that legislation is, um, you know, can be jumped across by minors who get accounts where they pretend to be adults and etc. But it does make it a little bit more difficult. And I think that is something that could happen. Uh, that is essentially putting aside the difficulty of determining what exactly is quote unquote targeted at children. Um, that is something that could be uh, envisioned, but uh, we'll see how far that piece of legislation goes. My suspicion is not very. Um, DNA, the company that is working with Nintendo, uh, has announced a new Pokemon mobile game uh, for this fiscal year. So before March 20, before the end of March 2020, uh, we don't know anything about it, but uh, that's an interesting announcement. Microsoft has teased a new AR uh, My Minecraft game. So uh, that would be a, we'll know more in a few weeks, but that would be, it looks like it would be kind of a Pokemon Go type thing. So between that, Pokemon Go and uh, Harry Potter Wizards Unite, we would have a lot of uh, similar games coming to our mobile phones uh, this summer. I wouldn't be surprised if that Minecraft thing came out this summer and would have the same kind of uh, mechanics. Dead Cells is coming uh, on, out on iOS and uh, a little bit later on Android. It's coming out on iOS this summer. Uh, if you haven't played Dead Cells, I don't know exactly how well it will translate with uh, mobile controls, but that will be an option. I suspect it, won't, it will be a little bit cheaper. Um, PUBG's mobile version is being replaced in China with something that is more China-compatible meaning it's safeguarding the children um, <laughs> by making it less violent. For example, it's essentially the same game, but it's tweaked in uh, some ways. Like, for example, when um, you kill someone in PUBG Mobile, in that uh, actually it's not called PUBG anymore. It's called Brand Shoot or something like that. <laughs> Can't remember the name of that, uh, of that game. Oh, my God. Um, oh, game for game for peace, which is so weird. Um, they essentially, when you shoot someone in the game, they get up, wave goodbye at you, and hand you a like loot box or something. And it's called game for peace, and it's still a battle royale game. You shoot people, and you are supposed to be the last one uh, standing. But yeah, this is to be more um, patriotic and uh, get the approval of the Chinese government. Uh, it's patriotic, I'm guessing, in other ways than just having the people you shot wave at you. Um, but it's, yeah, that's what, what you do when you're in China. And I guess they're, the core of the game, I'm guessing, doesn't change, so it doesn't matter all that much, but still. Ooh, and uh, Apex Legends is apparently headed to mobile. I believe uh, that's a hint we got from the EA uh, investors call um, a few days ago. Was it the investors call? Uh, but yeah, I mean, 
I remember when uh, PUBG, not PUBG, Apex Legends just came out. Uh, I think the first thing I said was when it was so successful, yeah, that's coming to mobile. Uh, and a lot of people were skeptical, but really they shouldn't have been. It is obvious that these games make the bulk of their money on mobile. And I don't know who would want to not have all the money that that represents. So yeah, coming to mobile at some point. And uh, to finish up the show, um, I did want to talk about a, a little bit of the, well, I don't really want to talk about it, but there's a lot of uh, discussion about the um, crunch happening at Epic for, you know, to, to um, manage Fortnite's success, which is pretty horrendous. Uh, there's some things coming out uh, of... I, the, the epic one was from Polygon. US Gamer uh, uh, had a report. Maybe I should mention the names of the journalists. That is just good practice, actually. So the one on uh, Fortnite and Epic is from Colin Campbell at Polygon. And the one for NetherRealm and uh, US Gamer is by Matt Kim. And the, the one on NetherRealm is especially... Frust or interesting and frustrating because it talks a lot about contract workers and how they're being strung along. Um, and NetherRealm employees themselves are fine, but the contract workers do a huge amount of the work and are basically not getting the advantages or conditions that uh, NetherRealm full employees are getting, which is a little bit distressing when you, you read the actual article. So that's something that keeps happening um, or that we keep hearing about hopefully well you hopefully you know what i think of all of this <laughs> essentially if i have to summarize my thoughts the thing is that doesn't change without uh, rebalancing balancing the force and for that you need uh gamers or game industry workers to to come together under a union. That's the only way I can think about to help um, there. And again, unions are not going to all of a sudden mean that you can't make games. Um, it, the worst thing that could happen is that they might take a little bit more time to come out. Um, but, you know, the, 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 that would essentially eat a little bit into the profits of those very big companies, which, yeah, is not, you know, I'm not a, a, a communist. I don't think that is the ideal situation, but they are making a lot of money. And in order to have um, these people not suffer in that way, if that's the price we have to pay, literally, I think it's an acceptable societal price. And I would really encourage you to read those articles um, because this is not an isolated inc incident. It is systemic. And I talk about it a lot in this show because it's a topic of conversation in the industry and that's what we cover. But, you know, at some point when you see 15 fires uh, or 15 uh, uh, columns of smoke, then maybe it's time to do something about the fires. And uh, I think it's happening. You know, we're, we're talking about all of this more and more, and I think mindsets are changing. And the, the, the important thing to remember is this is not going to, I don't think, impact the gaming industry negatively. Uh, if, if anything, it would make things better for, I think, for everyone. But anyway, uh, by the way, um, Respawn is saying that they are not crunching, um, even though they have to manage the success of Apex Legends. Um, now, of course, the counter argument is, well, Apex Legends is dipping in uh, viewership and all that, probably because they didn't have as fast updates as Fortnite did, which Fortnite was able to achieve because of crunch, etc., etc. I don't know that this is necessarily the case. Um, I think Fortnite was way more successful because it's uh, popular with kids and it's becoming a playground for kids and Apex Legends was very popular for the first few weeks and then the popularity dipped back to a level that was much higher than what they expected uh, in the beginning to begin with so it's not as black and white but still uh, Apex Legends is certainly not as popular as as Fortnite um I don't think if all of this can be attributed maybe it would have stayed a little bit more relevant if they had crunched 
like crazy, but I don't think it would have all of a sudden magically stayed at the, the in, insane hype levels that it was at when it launched. Um, what else? What else? Uh, well, I guess the last thing I do want to mention, there are two things. First, talking about Fortnite, there was a really interesting article in Polygon. Um, uh, them, again, you know, I, I've said that a couple of times, but the people who think video game journalism is not good, first of all, it was never true. But in the past couple of years, we've seen so much incredible reporting on, ironically, sites that were attacked for the way they were uh, doing journalism. Sites like Kotaku and Polygon, which, uh, you know, it's it's a lot. It has a lot to do with the GamerGate movement. So the reason that they were attacked or mocked or derided was not actually what the people were talking about. But my point is. Those sites specifically, but others, as I've mentioned, are doing such great reporting. And this article by uh, Patricia Hernandez is another great example of that, of how Fortnite is having a, uh, a, a unexpected consequence um, of, of creating this bullying um, uh, uh, con- situation between kids who can afford to get uh, special skins and those who can't. And that is really uh, unexpected. You know, Fortnite has a lot of, you know, it could be discussed in many ways for many things. But essentially what's happening is that um, not everywhere, of course, but in some uh, instances, um, the kids who can't afford to have custom skins and who just use the default uh, skins from the game, which don't affect anything, are being bullied. And the term default, like being a default, is becoming a uh, derogatory term for things inside Fortnite and outside of Fortnite as well. It goes really far. Like kids, you know, kids have always been cruel. And that's how you learn not to be cruel, I guess. It's by being cruel a little bit and hopefully your parents teach you how what's important and and how to not be uh, you know how to be a good person but still uh living through those things is how you learn empathy as as well and you can't i don't think it's always the parents fault if, if the kids are mean um but what happens in fortnite just like in the pl- playground i suppose is that uh they gang up against kids who don't have a, um, a a custom skin, like a skin that they won or that they bought. Uh, and they there's this urban legend that having a non-default skin makes you better at the game. Um, and I'm not going to summarize the entire article there, but it is really interesting and a great read. And again, Fortnite didn't invent cruelty in kids um and this is just one place to for it to express itself but it's a place that is i think unexpected and that we wouldn't expect would take this form um so it's good to know it it doesn't condemn fortnite it doesn't you know maybe they could do things maybe they could and maybe they will communicate the fact that you know the skins don't make you uh more powerful more clearly maybe they don't want to do that because they want to sell more of them and that uh urban legend is is uh advantageous to them in that regard but um yeah it's it's a really interesting uh part of that cultural phenomenon that i didn't even suspect um and finally the sonic the movie um (laughs) the the disaster that uh, we all lived through with that Twitter reveal of the trailer. So as you've seen, I'm certain Sonic, uh, Sonic, why am I saying Sonic? Uh, Sonic, it looks horrible. The design is horrendous. And the director has come out and said, we get, we get it. Uh, all right, we're going to rework it. And there are two things that are notable here. Uh, first of all, yes. Obviously, the 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 looks of that design is, as we discussed with uh, Terpster, I believe, last episode, horrendous. Horrendous. How did they... Who thought this would be a good idea? 
I, I do not get it. Um, oh, I think we only discussed what we thought was going to be with Ter Terpster, but how did Sega, maybe they don't have a say, but how did Sega agree to that? Um, and then what does that mean for the animators? Oh, they're going to rework the model and it's the release date is going to stay the same. So at this stage in a movie's production cycle, it's impossible to change that model without major um, reworks to the entire uh, uh, movie. You know, like the model itself, of course, but animations have to be redone. Um, and those poor animators are probably going to have to work a lot. We were talking about crunch. That is a common theme that has been um, uh, mentioned throughout the, uh, uh, the the commentating press, I think. <coughs> Oops, apologies. Uh, that's what happens when I can't breathe and I talk too much. Mm. And um, so what does that mean for them? And the second thing is, a lot of people have discussed um, the creative intent of the director and what it means if um, they just change their... It's Jeff Fowler, by the way, uh, the director. What does it mean if the uh, uh, angry Twitter mob um, makes him change his mind? Was his creative intent strong to begin with? <laughs> I'm guessing probably not. This seems like something that had been discussed uh, internally very much. And someone was saying, we have to change this. And someone was saying, no, no way. We're sticking with our uh, uh, design for whatever reason. And when they saw what was happening on Twitter and elsewhere, they just already knew that that was a possibility. Maybe they were preparing for it anyway but i don't think so my takeaway on the creative intent there is that it doesn't really factor in because this is maybe i'm wrong and feel free to disagree with me but i don't think this has a strong creative intent behind it it's not like someone said this is the sonic that is meant to be in this movie this is the creative vision I have. Maybe the director did, but then he folded very quickly. I don't know why. But I don't think anyone has anything good to say about this. And usually when you're talking about the debate around creative intent, you have some people who love one thing and some people who dislike it. And at that point, creative intent is a valid discussion. And maybe even if the some people who like it are a small group, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it is valid about art. It's valid about many, many things. Uh, I mean, art as in like a uh, museum type of art. Uh, it's also valid, of course, in gaming and movies and all of that. I think this is the one example of an exception that confirms the rule, right? It's an exception where <laughs> in this case, creative intent, I really don't think applies I haven't seen anything that leads me to believe that there was a strong um, creative mind behind this design. Not in the creative team with this reversal and not in the reaction of the public, which is a factor in all of this. If at least some people were standing up and saying, no, this is the Sonic we want for this movie or this makes sense or this any reason, anything really then there could be a discussion there. But when no one wants it, and even the director is saying, all right, we don't, we don't want it either, essentially, um, the creative intent discussion, I think, doesn't apply. So even though it usually applies to almost everything. So, yeah, that was my two cents on this. So, yeah, that is it for this uh, episode of Pixels, which an hour, see, I can talk. I guess uh, I know that I can, but now everyone does too. Um, a, a lot of uh, stuff coming up. I wonder if we'll have another episode before E3. I mean, E3 is in, as I said, I think three weeks. But uh, the closer we get to it, the uh, least 
less news there is, so we'll see if we do another one. But um, if we do, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. It will probably be that. There might be games I uh, want to talk about if I played them. We'll see. And uh, if we don't, the next one will be the uh, big Buxels Fiesta, hopefully, with Scott. I haven't actually confirmed we're doing it, but... It's become a tradition, so we will be uh, probably commentating the uh, E3 conferences live, and um, we will also be doing a wrap-up with uh, the Booksels common show between Boop and Pixels um, at the end of E3, probably the day after the last conference has uh, happened. So look forward to that. And until then, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram under the name NotPatrick, as always. And you can find this show at frenchspin.com um, if you want to comment on anything I've said. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back in a few weeks. Bye.